Section 17 of the South Pole. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Jevons. The South Pole by Roald Amundsen. Translation by A. G. Carter. Section 17. Volume 1, Chapter 8. A Day at Framheim. Part 2. It was now eight o'clock. The door from the kitchen to the room was left wide open, and the warmth streamed in and mixed with the fresh air that Stubberud had now forced to come down the right way. Now it was pleasanter inside, fresh, warm air everywhere. Then came a very interesting scene. As the tooth-brushing gentlemen returned, they had to guess the temperature, one by one. This gave occasion for much joking and fun, and amid laughter and chat the first meal of the day was taken. In after-dinner speeches, amid toasts and enthusiasm, our polar explorers are often compared with our forefathers, the bold Vikings. This comparison never occurred to me for a moment when I saw this assemblage of ordinary, everyday men brushing their teeth. But now that they were busy with the dishes, I was bound to acknowledge its aptitude, for our forefathers, the Vikings, could not possibly have attacked their food with greater energy than these nine men did. One pile of hot chick after another disappeared as if they had been made of air, and I, in my simplicity, had imagined that one of them was a man's ration. Spread with butter and surmounted with jam, these cakes slipped down with fabulous rapidity. With a smile I thought of the conjurer, holding an egg in his hand one minute and making it disappear the next. If it is a cook's best reward to see his food appreciated, then indeed Lindstrom had good wages. The cakes were washed down with big bowls of strong, aromatic coffee. One could soon trace the effect, and conversation became general. The first great subject was a novel, which was obviously very popular, and which was called The Rome Express. It appeared to me, from what was said, I have unfortunately never read this celebrated work, that a murder had been committed in this train, and a lively discussion arose as to who had committed it. I believe the general verdict was one of suicide. I have always supposed that subjects of conversation must be very difficult to find on expeditions like these, where the same people mix day after day for years, but there was certainly no sign of any such difficulty here. No sooner had the express vanished in the distance than in steamed the language question, and it came at full steam too. It was clear that there were adherents of both camps present. For fear of hurting the feelings of either party I shall abstain from setting down what I heard but I may say as much as this, that the party of reform ended by declaring the Marl to be the only proper speech of Norway, while their opponents maintained the same of their language. After a while pipes came out, and the scent of plug soon struggled with the fresh air for supremacy. Over the tobacco the work for the day was discussed. "'Well, I'll have enough to do supplying that wood-swallower over the holiday,' said Hassel. I gave a chuckle. If Hassel had known of the way the paraffin was used that morning, he would have added something about the oil-drinker, I expect. It was now half-past eight, and Stubberud and Bjarland got up. From the number of different garments they took out and put on, I guessed they were going out. Without saying anything, they trudged out. Meanwhile the others continued their morning smoke, and some even began to read, but by about nine they were all on the move. They put on their skin clothing, and made ready to go out. By this time Bjarland and Stipperud had returned from a walk, as I understood from such remarks as, "'Beastly cold!' and "'Sharp snow by the depot!' and the like. Prestrud was the only one who did not get ready to go out. He went to an open space underneath the farthest bunk, where there was a box. He raised the lid of this, and three chronometers appeared. At the same moment three of the men produced their watches, and a comparison was made and entered in a book. After each watch had been compared, its owner went outside, taking his watch with him. I took the opportunity of slipping out with the last man. Prestrud and his chronometers were too serious for me. I wanted to see what the others were about. There was plenty of life outside. Dogs' howls in every key came from the tents. Some of those who had left the house before us were out of sight, so they had probably gone to their respective tents and presently one could see by the lights that they were in the act of letting their dogs loose. How well the lighted-up tents looked against the dark, star-strewn sky! 
though it could no longer be called dark, the little flush of dawn had spread and overpowered the glow of the aurora australis, which had greatly decreased since I last saw it. Evidently it was near its end. Now the four-footed band began to swarm out, darting like rockets from the tents. Here were all colours, grey, black, red, brown, white, and a mixture of all of them. What surprised me was that they were all so small, but otherwise they looked splendid, plump and round, well-kept and groomed, bursting with life. They instantly collected into little groups of from two to five, and it was easy to see that these groups consisted of intimate friends. They absolutely petted each other. In each of these clusters there was one in particular who was made much of. All the others came round him, licked him, fawned upon him, and gave him every sign of deference. They all run about without a sign of unfriendliness. Their chief interest seems to be centred in two large black mounds that are visible in the foreground of the camp. What they are I am unable to make out. There is not enough light for that. But I am probably not far wrong in guessing that they are seals. They are rather hard eating, anyhow, for I can hear them crunching under the dog's teeth. Here there is an occasional disturbance of the peace. They do not seem to agree so well over their food. But there is never a regular battle. A watchman is present, armed with a stick, and when he shows himself and makes his voice heard, they soon separate. They appear to be well disciplined. What appealed to me most was the youngsters, and the youngest of all. The young ones, to judge from their appearance, were about ten months old. They were perfect in every way. One could see that they had been well cared for from their birth. Their coats were surprisingly thick, much more so than those of the older dogs. They were remarkably plucky, and would not give in to any one. And there are the smallest of all. Like little balls of wool, they roll themselves in the snow and have great fun. I am astonished that they can stand the cold as they do. I should never have thought that such young animals could live through the winter. Afterwards I was told that they not only bore the cold well, but were far more hardy than the older ones. While the grown-up dogs were glad to go into their tents in the evening, the little ones refused to do so. They preferred to sleep outside. And they did so for a great part of the winter. Now all the men have finished unchaining their dogs, and with their lanterns in their hands they move in various directions and disappear, apparently into the barrier surface. There will be many interesting things to see here in the course of the day, I can understand that. What on earth became of all these people? There we have Amundsen. He is left alone and appears to be in charge of the dogs. I go up to him and make myself known. Ah, I'm glad you came, he says. Now I can introduce you to some of our celebrities. To begin with, here is the trio, Fix, Lasser and Snipperson. They always behave like this when I am out, could not think of leaving me in peace for an instant. Fix, that big grey one that looks like a wolf, has many a snap on his conscience. His first exploit was on Fleckero, near Christiansand, where all the dogs were kept for a month after they arrived from Greenland. There he gave Lindstrom a nasty bite when his back was turned. What do you think of a bite of a mouth like that? Fix is now tame, and without a growl allows his master to take hold of his upper and under jaws and open his mouth. Ye gods, what teeth! I inwardly rejoice that I was not in Lindstrom's trousers that day. If you notice, he continues with a smile, you will see that Lindstrom still sits down cautiously. I myself have a mark on my left calf, and a good many more of us have the same. There are several of us who still treat him with respect. And here we have Lasserson. That's his pet name. He was christened Lasser. Almost pure black, as you see. I believe he was the wildest of the lot when they came on board. I had him fastened up on the bridge with my other dogs, beside Fix. Those two were friends from their Greenland days. But I can tell you that when I had to pass Lasser, I always judged the distance first. As a rule, he just stood looking down at the deck, exactly like a mad bull. If I tried to make overtures, he didn't move, stood quite still, but I could see how he drew back his upper lips and showed a row of teeth with which I had no desire to become acquainted. A fortnight passed in this way. Then at last the upper lip sank and the head was raised a little, as though he wanted to see who it was that brought him food and water every day. But the way from that to friendship was long and tortuous. In the time that followed I used to scratch him on the back with a stick. At first he jumped round, seized the stick, and crushed it between his teeth. I thought myself lucky that it was not my hand. 
I came a little nearer to him every day, until one day I risked my hand. He gave me an ugly look, but did nothing. And then came the beginning of our friendship. Day by day we became better friends, and now you can see what footing we are on. The third is Snipperson, a dark red lady. She is their sworn friend and never leaves them. She is the quickest and most active of our dogs. You can see that she is fond of me. She is generally on her hind legs and makes every effort to get at my face. I have tried to get her out of the way of that, but in vain. She will have her own way. I have no other animals for the moment that are worth showing, unless you would care to hear a song. If so, there is Uranus, who is a professional singer. We'll take the trio with us, and you shall hear. We made for two black and white dogs that were lying by themselves on the snow a little way off, while the three jumped and danced about us. As we approached the other two, and they caught sight of the trio, they both jumped up as though at a word of command, and I guessed that we had found the singer. Lord, save us! What an awful voice! I could see that the concert was for Lasse's benefit, and Uranus kept it up as long as we stood in his vicinity. But then my attention was suddenly aroused by the appearance of another trio, which made an extraordinary favourable impression. I turned to my companion for information. Yes, he continued, those are three of Hansen's team, probably some of our best animals. The big black and white one is called Zanko. He appears to be rather old. The two others, which look like sausages with matches underneath, are Ring and Mylius. As you see, they are not very big, rather on the small side, but they are undoubtedly among our best workers. From their looks we have concluded that they are brothers. They are as alike as two drops of water. Now we will go straight through the mass and see whether we come across any more celebrities. There we have Carenius, Sauen, Schwartz, and Lucy. They belong to Stuberud and are a power in the camp. Bjarland's tent is close by. His favourites are lying there, Kvine, Lap, Pan, Gorky, and Yala. They are small, all of them, but fine dogs. There, in the southeast corner, stands Hassel's tent, but we shall not see any of his dogs here now. They are all lying outside the entrance to the oil store, where he is generally to be found. The next tent is Visting's. We must take a turn round there and see if we can find his lot. Ah, there they are, those four playing there. The big, reddish-brown one on the right is the Colonel, our handsomest animal. His three companions are Sugen, Ardner, and Brun. I must tell you a little story about the Colonel when he was on Fleckero. He was perfectly wild then, and he broke loose and jumped into the sea. He wasn't discovered till he was halfway between Fleckero and the mainland, where he was probably going in search of a joint of mutton. Visting and Lindstrom, who were then in charge of the dogs, put off in a boat and finally succeeded in overtaking him, but they had a hard tussle before they managed to get him on board. Afterwards, Visting had a swimming race with the Colonel, but I don't remember what was the result. We can expect a great deal of these dogs. There's Johansson's tent over in the corner. There's not much to be said about his dogs. The most remarkable of them is Camilla. She is an excellent mother and brings up her children very well. She usually has a whole army of them, too. Now, I expect you have seen dogs enough, so if you have no objection, I will show you underground Framheim and what goes on there. I may just as well add that we are proud of this work, and you will probably find that we have a right to be. We'll begin with Hassel, as his department is nearest. We now went in the direction of the house, passed its western end, and soon arrived at an erection that looked like a derrick. Underneath it was a large trap-door. Where the three legs of the derrick met, there was made fast a small block, and through the block ran a rope made fast at one end to the trap-door. A weight hung at the other end, some feet above the surface of the snow. "'Now we are at Hassel's,' said my companion. It was a good thing he could not see me, for I must have looked rather foolish. "'At Hassel's,' I said to myself. "'What in the world does the man mean? We were standing on the bare barrier. "'Do you hear that noise? That's Hassel's sawing wood.' Now he bent down and raised the heavy trap-door easily with the help of the weight. Broad steps of snow led down, deep down, into the barrier. We left the trap-door open so as to have the benefit of the little daylight there was. My host went first, I followed. After descending four or five steps we came to a doorway which was covered with a woollen curtain. We pushed this aside. The sound that had first reached me as a low rumbling now became sharper and I could plainly hear that it was caused by sawing. We went in. 
The room we entered was long and narrow, cut out of the barrier. On a solid shelf of snow there lay barrel after barrel, arranged in exemplary order. If they were all full of paraffin, I began to understand Lindstrom's extravagance in lighting his fire in the morning. Here was paraffin enough for several years. In the middle of the room a lantern was hanging, an ordinary one with wire netting round the glass. In a dark room it certainly would not have given much light, but in these white surroundings it shone like the sun. A primus lamp was burning on the floor. The thermometer, which hung a little way from the primus, showed minus five degrees Fahrenheit, so Hassel could hardly complain of the heat, but he had to saw, so it did not matter. We approached Hassel. He looked as if he had plenty to do, and was sawing away so that the sawdust was flying. "'Morning?' "'Morning.' The sawdust flew faster and faster. "'You seem to be busy to-day.' "'Oh, yes.' The saw was now working with dangerous rapidity. "'If I'm to get finished for the holiday, I must hurry up. "'How's the coal supply getting on?' That took effect. The saw stopped instantly, was raised and put down by the wall. I waited for the next step in suppressed excitement. Something hitherto undreamt of must be going to happen. Hassel looked round. One can never be careful enough. Approached my host, and whispered with every sign of caution— I did him out of twenty-five kilos last week. I breathed again. I had expected something much worse than that. With a smile of satisfaction, Hassel resumed his interrupted work, and I believe nothing in the world would have stopped him again. The last I saw as we returned through the doorway was Hassel surrounded by a halo of sawdust. We were back on the barrier surface. A touch of the finger and the trap-door swung over and fell noiselessly into its place. I could see that Hassel was capable of other things besides sawing birchwood. Outside lay his team, guarding all his movements, Mikkel, Riven, Masmus, and Elsa. They all looked well. Now we were going to see the others. We went over to the entrance of the hut and raised the trap-door. A dazzling light met my eyes. In the wall of the steps leading down from the surface, a recess had been cut to hold a wooden case lined with bright tin. This contained a little lamp which produced this powerful light. But it was the surroundings that made it so bright, ice and snow everywhere. Now I could look about me for the first time. It had been dark when I came in the morning. There was the snow tunnel leading to the penthouse. I could see that by the threshold that grinned at me. But there, in the opposite direction, what was there? I could see that the passage was continued, but where did it lead? Standing in the bright light, it looked quite dark in the tunnel. "'Now we will go and see Bjarland first. With these words my companion bent down and set off through the dark passage. "'Look there, in the snow wall, just under our feet. Can you see the light?' By degrees my eyes had accustomed themselves to the darkness of the tunnel, and I could see a greenish light shining through the snow wall where he pointed. And now another noise fell on my ears, a monotonous sound, coming from below. "'Look out for the steps.' "'Yes, he could be sure of that. "'I had come one cropper that day, and it was enough. "'We once more descended into the barrier "'by broad, solid snow-steps covered with boards. "'Suddenly a door was opened, "'a sliding door in the snow wall, "'and I stood in Bjarland's and Stibber's premises. "'The place might be about six feet high, fifteen feet long, and seven feet wide. "'On the floor lay masses of shavings "'which made it warm and cosy. At one end stood a primus lamp, with a large tin case over it, from which steam was issuing. "'How's it going?' "'All right. We're just bending the runners. I've made a rough estimate of the weight, and find I can bring it down to forty-eight pounds.' This seemed to me almost incredible. Amundsen had told me on the way up this morning of the heavy sledges they had, a hundred and sixty-five pounds each, and now Bjarland was going to bring them down to forty-eight pounds, less than a third of their original weight. In the snow walls of the room were fixed hooks and shelves where the tools were kept. Bjarland's carpenter's bench was massive enough, cut out in the snow and covered with boards. Along the opposite wall was another planing bench, equally massive, but somewhat shorter than the first. This was evidently Stubberud's place. He was not here to-day, but I could see that he was engaged in planing down the sledge-cases and making them lighter. One of them was finished. I leaned forward and looked at it. On the top 
where a little round aluminium lid was let in, was written, Original weight, nine kilos. Reduced weight, six kilos. I could understand what this saving of weight meant to men who were going on such a journey as these had before them. One lamp provided all the illumination, but it gave an excellent light. We left Bjarland. I felt sure that the sledging outfit was in the best of hands. We then made our way into the penthouse, and here we met Stibberid. He was engaged in cleaning up and putting things straight for the holiday. All the steam that came out of the kitchen, when the door was opened, had condensed on the roof and walls in the form of rime several inches thick, and Stubberud was now clearing this off with a long broom. Everything was going to be shipshape for midwinter eve. I could see that. We went in. Dinner was on, humming and boiling. The kitchen floor was scrubbed clean, and the linoleum with which it was covered shone gaily. It was the same in the living room. Everything was cleaned. The linoleum on the floor and the American cloth on the table were equally bright. The air was pure, absolutely pure. All the bunks were made tidy, and the stools put in their places. There was no one here. You have only seen a fraction of our underground palaces, but I thought we would take a turn in the loft first and see what it's like. Follow me. We went out into the kitchen, and then up some steps fastened in the wall, and through the trap-door to the loft. With the help of a little electric lamp we were able to look about us. The first thing that met my eyes was the library. There stood the Framheim Library, and it made the same good impression as everything else. Books numbered from one to eighty in three shelves. The catalogue lay by the side of them, and I cast my eye over it. Here were books to suit all tastes. Librarian Adolf Henrik Lindström, I read at the end. So he was librarian, too. Truly a many-sided man. Long rows of cases stood here, full of whortleberry jam, cranberries, syrup, cream, sugar, and pickles. In one corner I saw every sign of a dark room. A curtain was hung up to keep the light off, and there was an array of developing dishes, measuring glasses, etc. This loft was made good use of. We had now seen everything, and descended again to continue our inspection. Just as we reached the penthouse, Lindstrom came in with a big bucket of ice. I understood that it was to be used in the manufacture of water. My companion had armed herself with a large and powerful lantern, and I saw that we were going to begin our underground travels. In the north wall of the penthouse there was a door, and through this we went, entering a passage built against the house, and dark as the grave. The lantern had lost its power of illumination. It burned with a dull, dead light which did not seem to penetrate beyond the glass. I stretched my hands in front of me. My host stopped, and gave me a lecture on the wonderful order and tidiness they had succeeded in establishing among them. I was a willing listener, for I had already seen enough to be able to certify the truth of what he told me without hesitation. But in the place we were now in, I had to take his word for it, for it was all as black as bilge water. We had just started to move on again, and I felt so secure, after all he had told me about the orderly way things were kept, that I let go my guide's anorak, which I had been holding. But that was foolish of me. Smack! I went down at full length. I had trodden on something round, something that brought me down. As I fell I caught hold of something, also round, and I lay convulsively clutching it. I wanted to convince myself of what it was that lay about on the floor of such a tidy house. The glimmer of the lantern, though not particularly strong, was enough to show me what I held in my arms. A Dutch cheese. I put it back in the same place, for the sake of tidiness, sat up and looked down at my feet. What was it I had stumbled over? A Dutch cheese, if it wasn't another of the same family. I began to form my own opinion of the tidiness now, but said nothing. But I should like to know why he didn't fall over the cheeses as he was walking in front. Oh, I answered myself, I guess he knew what sort of order the place was in. End of section 17